Viewers, welcome to TV Metro Mail. You are watching Chit Chat, and I am Imamul Haq. I am very delighted today because I have a few special guests with me today. Uh, we have uh, our faith leaders from our community. So let me start, uh, let me bring them on screen first. Uh, and then we'll talk about, uh, as you know, that we are talking about death today. So welcome you all to our show. Thank you. Thank you. So, May I kindly request you, let's start with uh, giving us a bit of introduction about yourself. So can we start with uh, Imam Yusuf Badat? Yeah, sure. Uh, greetings of peace and blessings be with each and every one of you. It's my pleasure to be on this program this evening. And uh, in particular, my name is Yusuf Badat. I'm one of the imams here at the Islamic Foundation of Toronto, which is one of the uh, larger mosques in the Toronto East area. And um, I've been serving there for approximately uh, 17 odd years. And um, uh, I work with youth. I, I work with adults. I, I do a lot of outreach and interfaith as well. I also run a program uh, through the Mathaba Institute. And it's always my pleasure to be on uh, these type of programs where we interact with one another uh, to talk about uh, real issues. Uh, that are facing our community. So I hope that uh, serves as a brief introduction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yusuf Badat. So, Brian McIntosh, may I request you to introduce yourself as well? Sure. Uh, my name is Brian McIntosh. I serve uh, the good people of Bloordale United Church here in Etobicoke. I've been here about 12 years. I've been in ministry for about 32 and a half or something like that, not some county. And uh, I uh, uh, serve on many uh, active uh, community groups and uh, social action groups uh, on climate, indigenous right relations. Had a long uh, history of uh, interfaith relations as well, and I'm happy to be a co-curler with uh, your other guest, Michael. So looking forward to speaking. Today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. So, Michael, this is your turn now. <laughs> Thank you, Amamo. Uh, my name is Rabbi Michael Dolgan. Uh, I serve Temple Sinai Congregation of Toronto, uh, a large reform congregation. That means we're part of the progressive Jewish community locally here in Toronto, in Canada, and in worldwide. And worldwide, I'm in my 30th year of serving Temple Sinai Congregation. And so I've had the privilege during that time uh, to work with many other faith leaders in our community uh, doing interfaith work. Uh, as well as looking to connect to people of all ages and to look uh, particularly for uh, new frontiers in um, mixing uh, Jewish social and cultural aspects of our tradition uh, for our benefit and uh, likewise to uh, help our community and the larger community to wrestle, wrestle with major issues of the day. It's an honor to be with my colleagues and with all of you here tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rabbi uh, uh, Michael. As you know that we today we will be talking about uh, a little bit of unusual issue. We don't want to talk about death, uh, you know, in our lifetime, but uh, we have to face that in any way. So we thought that let us discuss about death. So that will help us to live a healthy life as well, probably. So we'll hear from you, but before going into that, let us uh, let me once again welcome you all to our show, to my show, and thank you very much. I'm very excited to have you all in my show and talking about that important issue. So when we talk about uh, death, you know, in community, or when we try to conceptualize the concept of death, or when we think about death, you know, we always refer to uh, the fact that, you know, the, it is nothing but to end of a life so we'd like to hear from uh, you know different faith that how different faith uh, you know conceptualize that uh, i would like to start with uh, rabbi michael dolgan well thank you mom uh, it's uh, it, it's quite a uh, a challenging topic uh, the jewish tradition's view of uh, the human condition and human reality is essential to our view of life and death. We view our uh, human beings as being a miraculous mixture of body and soul, the body being material and part of uh, this world uh, in which we live, 
and the soul being uh, effectively the breath of God within each and every one of us. And it is wondrous and somewhat mysterious how it is that our soul uh, and our body can be linked, and yet they are, and it's that phenomenon that we call being alive, that our eternal soul is connected to our physical body. And that when those two um, lose that connection, when that connection comes to an end, uh, that's really what we call uh, death, often because of some kind of physical event or illness uh, that affects our physical being. Um, and the soul, while connected to the body, is affected, but lives on beyond that experience that we call death. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Yusuf, Imam Yusuf Badat, so how do we, from uh, Islam, how do we conceptualize that? Yeah, uh, for sure. Death is a reality that no one can run away from. Uh, so, uh, again, what this um, death from the Islamic perspective is looked upon as actually a blessing. And the reason being is we have come from God and the only way we could physically and spiritually return to God from this temporary abode is through death. And that's why there is a very famous saying, uh, and that is, um, which basically translates as the that that death is a bridge. It takes the loved the the beloved to his or her beloved, meaning it takes us back to God. When someone passes away in Islam, we generally say inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun, which basically means to God we belong and to Him shall we return. And uh, very similar to how uh, our dear colleague the rabbi said. Uh, is that uh, it's a transition. So when we return to God, we're basically uh, our physical body. It is returned to the earth where we have been created from. But the soul is something that has no end. It's, it's eternal and it's from God. So we are going back to God's kingdom. And um, again, it's, 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 it's leaving this temporary abode and returning to where we actually came from, which is God's kingdom we call paradise or the akhirah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Yusuf Badat. Uh, Michael, uh, Brian, Brian, uh, how do you like to, you know, conceptualize that? I mean, in, in your faith. Yeah, so well, uh, very similar to the, the previous two colleagues of mine. Uh, um, insofar as uh, we are a holistic uh, single being, and uh, as Michael spoke of, we uh, have an eternal breath within us, the soul that animates our body and uh, gives us um, the opportunity to uh, live a life of uh, fullness toward God's purposes in the world. Um, but like taxes, you know, death, as uh, my esteemed colleague uh, Yusuf said, we uh, we can't avoid it. And uh, we, we do have a bit of a different uh, opinion. I think we, we in the Christian tradition, we talk uh, often, obviously, about resurrection, and that doesn't just mean the that the soul, uh, the eternal part of God within us to animate our life goes back to God, but it means that we have some continuing kind of personality or that, w that we're not just a... Uh, uh, we recognize one another in heaven, let's put it that way, and... Uh, that's always been the case. And, and the other thing to, that I try to think of is that uh, there's a difference between eternity and immortality. And yeah. immortality is just simply a, uh, uh, a continuation of the immortal soul in this, this time and space continuum, whereas eternity means that it's above time and space and beyond it. And, uh, when we say that we return to God, we're really talking about the eternal God uh, and not so much about our own immortality. We don't own it. Uh, it's a gift, in other words. Eternal life is a gift. It's a gift that we have in this life, and it's a gift that we will enjoy beyond life, beyond this life. So uh, that's part of what we look at when we're talking about death. 
Okay, okay. Thank you very much, Brian. So uh, it seems that, you know, as uh, Imam uh, Yusuf Badat says that we cannot run out uh, from the, you know, death. So this is very much part of our life. So since the death is a part of our life, so do we need to prepare for death? Or if yes, then how we can prepare for death? Because this is the obvious thing in our life. Because we do so many things, how we prepare ourselves for life, for different things. But death is ob obviously a fact of life. So how should we prepare for death? So again, I think we can start uh, with uh, Yusuf Badat. Yeah, sure. So when it comes to uh, pre preparation, uh, death is definitely a reality that we need to prepare for. Now, if we're talking about uh, physical arrangements when we pass away, for example, arranging our funeral and our shrouding and where and which mosque or church or synagogue our funeral procession will pass through, then definitely that's part of the preparation. But more importantly, uh, from an Islamic concept is we need to prepare for our meeting our physical meeting with our maker and creator. And the best way to prepare that is to live the teachings of God through the various scriptures in our lives. So if we are uh, loyal to God, if we're being great human beings, if we're developing good character, good morals, we're helping the poor and the needy, and we're doing our part as vicegerents and representative of God's work here on earth, then that's the best way to prepare ourselves because when we transition to God, and as one of my colleagues just pointed out, when we are resurrected and given this new life uh, with God in God's kingdom, then um, we will be blessed with the efforts that we uh, conducted in this temporary abode. And uh, from the Islamic concept, we have something called paradise, God's kingdom, where uh, you know, all the small efforts that we did throughout our lives, they will be returned many fold in different blessings that we can't even imagine. And I quote uh, a very famous um, a statement of the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad, peace and blessings upon him, where he talks about uh, uh, the blessings in the hereafter based on our efforts in this temporary abode. He says, <laughs> which basically means what God has prepared for his chosen servants who live his message on this earth, no mind has ever comprehended, no um, heart has ever imagined, and no tongue has ever spoken of. So what God has prepared for us in the next life is just amazing and outstanding. Thank you. Thank you very much, Imam Yusuf Badat. So meanwhile, we have uh, another guest. We have Shamol uh, Bhattacharji with us as well. So Thank he you. is a, a Hindu uh, priest, Hindu leader, a religious faith leader. So welcome to our show, Shamol. I think probably you can hear us, right? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. So we were discussing about, you know, uh, this is the second issue we are dealing with. We were talking about what is death according to a particular faith. So if you just give us some idea about that, how you like to, you know, uh, conceptualize death according to your faith, then we'll move uh, to the second question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good evening. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to participate in today's uh, discussion on death. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, issue that we can uh, discuss elaborately and we can get uh, more ideas about uh, uh, the concept of death. Uh, well, gentlemen, uh, all, all the uh, viewers, uh, before we proceed to talk about death, we must begin the subject matter topics with the concept of birth. Uh, birth means born, and today we focus about human birth not other birth, but in generally, we are talking, we are, we have our main uh, interest of the birth of human being. Uh, the world is a beautiful place. Among all living creatures, human beings are the top in status. And because human have the sense or independent thinking capabilities, which other living beings or other living creatures does not have 
as equal to a human being as a man. So we must acknowledge that we are very fortunate and awarded with the highest gift of God to be as a human being or man. So Hindus believe that human are in a cycle of death and rebirth. When a person dies, their atma or the soul or the spirit is reborn in a different body. Some believe that rebirth happens directly at death. So the Hindu faith is eternal about reincarnation. Uh, the belief that the sum dies and they are reborn again. So our concept is that when a people die, he proceed to the God's court for the judgment of his whole life activities. This is in simple, in my uh, understanding, that is like okay, this. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. But what I have found that uh, almost somehow or other, it's the same that uh, the life is a gift. I think we all are saying some kind of the same thing. The life is a gift, right? Okay, thank you very much. We were dealing with the second issue, which was that, you know, if it is a fact of life, it is a very much part of life, then how we should prepare for death. So uh, Yusuf Badat has already shared uh, his thought. And then may I request uh, Rabbi Michael Dolgin that how we should prepare for death. Absolutely. And uh, the approach that uh, I understand my tradition to have is very much parallel with what uh, Sheikh Badat has uh, uh, shared with us. Um, that just as um, death is certain, so our actions are certain to be imperfect. Only God is perfect. And so human beings are not going to be able um, to uh, bat a thousand, so to speak, to make all the right choices and do all the right actions at all times. Um, and so uh, one of the central ideas of Jewish life and practice is what we call tshuva, which means repentance uh, or return. Um, that when someone has uh, gone astray, made an error, uh, um, uh, done the wrong thing, um, when that person sincerely um, uh, repents, um, is uh, apologetic and seeks to grow and learn and do better, that person actually at the end of that process is at a higher status than had they never gone astray in the first place. And I mentioned that teaching because our tradition asked the question, when should a person repent? And the answer, very much the answer to the question uh, that you're asking us, Imamul, is that one should repent a day before she or he dies. But none of us know when that day is to come. No. And so therefore, the only way to repent before death, to prepare for death, is to repent, to seek to improve ourselves, to learn, to grow, uh, to be better servants of the eternal and uh, better um, participants in the covenant with the divine each and every day. Um, and that certainly is uh, how we prepare, although um, I, I do know that in a program like this, it, it also is meaningful to talk about the actual physical preparations as Sheikh Badat mentioned, because many people simply want to avoid those topics. And our That's tradition right. is very supportive of people not waiting till after a person has died, uh, but to go ahead and make arrangements um, to the degree that's possible. We don't know when a person will die, but to do so in advance um, so that we can focus on the emotional experience, the spiritual experience, the personal experience of family and community at a time of death, rather than being distracted by the need to look after all of the details at that moment, as if we weren't prepared. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rabbi Michael Dolgin. Uh, Reverend Brian McIntyre, uh, what's your take on this? Well, you know, I, I agree with uh, much of what Michael's just said about the preparation of the individual for their uh, their their death, and it, it certainly relieves the community and their family of um, you know having to guess what they might have wanted to have happen in a, a ritual or in a gatherings or whatever. 
or their resting place or whatever it might be. But I think the, the, the wider issue of preparing for death is a, a really good one in this society that um, seems to be uh, focused primarily on uh, youth and uh, energy and invigoration and uh, almost an avoidance of death. There was a great uh, psychologist, Ernst Becker, who wrote a book, The Denial of Death. And um, I think we have a denial culture, frankly, uh, of death. And I think a lot of people um, don't want to think about death, don't want to talk about death, and don't even think much about uh, how they might live life better if they prepared for death in a way that was uh, accepting of death as the gift that uh, my colleague uh, Sheikh Badat said. Um, I think that at, at the base, as you summarize the first question's responses, Imam, uh, the grace of God is uh, un, undeserved, and uh, it will always be the case, uh, no matter if we live the best life that we possibly can live, and, uh, you know, are not an axe murderer or anything like that, but you know what I mean, we, we can't be perfect, as Michael said, we all need to repent, uh, and uh, we need to accept that the gift of uh, an afterlife is actually a gift. And that enables us to live life with gratitude all the way to our death, it, it seems to me. And uh, therefore, we're more prepared for our death because we've uh, already accepted its reality in our life. And we haven't avoided the topic. We've simply... Uh, relied on the grace of God to give us what we need uh, upon our death. So that that's uh, part of how we prepare for death, I think, is accepting it as the gift that uh, my colleagues have uh, stated it is, and uh, the afterlife as well is a gift. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. So since we all know that it's coming or it will come, it is obvious thing, and this is very much part of life, as we are saying. But still, I think why death is always fearful? I, I have, to, you know, the questions has two parts. Why? First is why death is always fearful to all of us or many of us. And what is the healthy way to accept death? Because there is no other alternative. We have to accept it. So why healthy way to accept it and why it is so fearful? So I, I can start with uh, uh, Sheikh Yusuf Badat. Yeah. Uh, so uh, from my perspective, why people fear death is that... Um, I feel that we as humans are too attached with uh, the worldly life that we are accustomed to. Our comforts, our uh, families, our material, all of this we are attached to. So when thinking about death, that, uh, you know, it, I'm going to leave this world and I'm going to detach from my family, from my material, from my kingdom here. And um, I think that sense of fear of leaving the pleasures of this temporary abode and uh, returning to God, I think that brings a sense of fear. Uh, from another perspective, um, many of us may not feel prepared to meet God in a physical sense, and therefore we fear I, I could have done better or I need to do better before I actually uh, return to God. As uh, the rabbi rightfully said, that uh, we need to repent, we need to constantly grow, we need to uh, change ourselves for the better. Imam Malik, who's a jurist in the Islamic tradition, uh, he says that the best way to prepare for death is actually to make each day better than the previous. So sometimes if we feel that we've erred or we failed or we haven't repented, then we have this sense of fear. If I die today, then I might not have been prepared as I should have been. So I think these are a few reasons why people fear death. Now, the second part to your question is that uh, how to face the reality in a healthy way. I believe is that uh, we all need to understand that God is very merciful. Even if we are detaching from our material and our comforts and family, uh, they are in God's hands. Uh, many people have passed away before us, and life in this world continues. People are still taken care of. Uh, people still have peace and prosperity. So even though we are leaving this temporary abode, God's mercy will envelope whatever we are leaving behind. 
and whatever we are fearing that is to come, again, have a positive notion about God embracing us. There's this concept of Bismillah, Imam, as you know, uh, that uh, whenever a believer does anything, he, he or she should take the name of God. So uh, one of the reasons is that whatever we are doing, we are asking for God's blessings and mercy. So if God is reminding us that he is immensely merciful, compassionate, then even if we have erred, even if we have made mistakes, but we've done our best, then God will definitely embrace us. He will overlook our shortcomings and he will enter us into the bliss of paradise. So I think if we look at uh, death as something that is positive, it's a reality we have to face, uh, then definitely uh, we will be better prepared. And at the same time, we will have a positive outlook uh, on uh, returning to God through this uh, concept of death. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Rabbi Michael Dolgin, so how do you, you know, what would be your advice to your followers that, how they can take uh, death, you know, in a healthy way. Because this is obvious. And yeah. why no, are I, so I, fearful? I appreciate the question. Um, and I, I want to also make a distinction. I do believe that people are afraid of death. Yeah. But I think there's an even greater fear of dying than of death. And by that, I mean the real process that leads up to the end of life. Um, that many I, I've encountered, spent many time, as I'm sure my colleagues have, talking to people in the last moments and the last stages of their lives. And it's, um, I wouldn't have guessed before I began my career that so many people, when death came, uh, in many ways, were at peace with that moment. But the loss of health, the awareness of the limits to our independence, um, the loss of control uh, of what's going on around us and even of our own bodies um, is justifiably very frightening. Um, and so people often are very afraid of dying. Um, I, I do believe that um, we are more able to face this fear if we're aware that we're not so independent as we seem to begin with. So much of what's given to us, so much of the, so many of the blessings in our lives are gifts uh, from the divine, strengthened by the, the community around us. And so if we live a life of awareness of the limits of our own control, um, and nevertheless, the great significance of our actions and uh, the potential within our souls, I think it helps us face the fear of dying, which is, again, I think, quite normal. Um, and death itself, um, I don't know even that families can be prepared for the death of a loved one. Death eventually is a, 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 a powerful moment. Um, it's holy and awe-inspiring and frightening, all wrapped together in many ways. Um, but I think uh, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to have this program to say to people, talk to your families and loved ones about death and dying, about your wishes, about your hopes, about your concerns. I think when we accept that we shouldn't even speak of something, that it creates a fear around it that is greater than is healthy or necessary. And the opportunity to speak about death, to talk about our own feelings, our experiences, our desires, um, I, I think that is an essential way to address um, this fear of death and dying and to do so in a healthy manner. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rabbi Michael. Brian, Brian McIntyre. So what is your take on this that, you know, why we are yeah. so fearful and how we can accept death healthy way, in a healthy way. You know, it says in the Bible, in uh, both Testaments, uh, as we, we look at the Bible anyway, that uh, uh, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. <laughs> but that's not fear as in uh, anx anxious. Uh, that, that's more like awe. It means more like awe and uh, reverence. And that's, so, you know, that uh, God is holy and other and uh, to be revered. Um, but uh, fear, fear is a debilitating often uh, emotion. 
And Jesus actually, more than any other phrase, used the phrase, be not afraid. If you count the number of times he said anything, including love your neighbor and all of the, those phrases that he's famous for, he's most famous for saying, be not afraid. And to me, that means uh, ex if it comes back to our, our recognition of life as a gift. And if life is a gift, then death is also uh, something not to be feared because life will go on beyond even this life. Uh, because we trust God to uh, make it so. Um, God gave us birth and God will give us uh, a rebirth beyond this life to be with God. Um, but having said that, uh, I think it's such a beautiful life uh, that we live and so many gifts that God has given us, the earth, the sun, our breath, our our being, uh, our bodies, our uh, our sensations, it, it's, it's all an amazing uh, life. Uh, and yet uh, we, we don't um, trust it and we try to uh, secure our own life, if I can put it that way. We try to make, uh, make we're under the illusion of our own control in life. And we're, we're actually not in, in control, as my colleague Rabbi uh, Michael said. We're, we're not in control completely of our lives, nor are we uh, ever going to be. And it's an illusion to think that we could achieve that. Um, and so if, if we're living in fear, we're trying to control and avoid what it is we're uh, afraid of. And it seems to me that uh, we're better served by by uh, uh, giving ourselves over to the trust of God in this life and the trust of God for the next life. Um, but uh, fear is a powerful emotion, and uh, it's uh, it's something that debilitates many, many people, and they kind of cocoon or they become fearful of uh, many things and not just death. And if you're fearful of death, then you are going to be fearful of other things as well, because death has this kind of finality to it. Um, it's the last thing to be feared, right? Um, <laughs> there isn't anything beyond that. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's really the way we look at death is a lesson for how we look at all of life in a, in a way, in, in a, our, our perspective. Anyway, that's... Okay. Th thank you. Thank you, Brian. So uh, now may I like to ask uh, Mr. Shamol, I think probably you have uh, heard the question. We are dealing with two things. One is why death is always fearful mm -hmm. and how we can accept death in a healthy way. So what do your state okay. says? Okay. Thank you very much for <clears throat> this uh, important issue uh, for uh, you put forward for discussion. Uh, the, when we say the life is a gift of God. If it is so, then we have to understand how we can make the whole life enjoyable. That is a very important thing that we have to be careful about it. And to be happy in the life, we should be attached to the spirituality all over our life. That helps us to understand or to proceed towards death in a peaceful manner in a happy manner, in an enjoyable manner. So if we think and doing nothing the whole life as in a spiritual attachment, at the end of the life, definitely life will be, seems to be as a very fearful. So we don't want to make life fearful. We want to make life enjoyable. If want to enjoyable, we have to be very careful of the whole day's activities whole year's activities, whole life's activities. At the end, we can make a conclusion that whole life, I take care of my life. At the end of the day, this life cannot be fearful. But as a natural law, the birth and death is there. So life, when became old, then the, we have to accept the reality of death. In our perspective, if we can maintain our life, we can do our life, whole life's activity in good karma, then 
there is no reason to be fearful at the time of death so we are very much fortunate that like if you do a real spiritual attachment in your lifetime death will be enjoyable not is a painful things so we want to make our life enjoyable to be really keep our attachment with the spirituality that helps to be in a good end of life enjoyable life and there is nothing to be worried about that thank, thank you. you thank you very much thank you very much viewer this is an opportunity for us to hear from our faith leaders and you are watching chit chat on tv metro main we are talking about death which usually we don't talk in a normal situation but uh, the different perspective of death uh, we are getting ideas from our faith leaders stay tuned with us there are more things uh, more issues to be covered so we'll uh, come back soon stay tuned <laughs>
is that a lot of people who have only a tangential relationship to church or to our Christian faith are opting for what I'll call celebrations of life with very little recognition of grief or uh, of the reality of death and the emotional release for those who have lost loved ones. And it becomes almost like a, a party often mm -hmm. where you only want to remember the good parts of a person's life and you don't want to remember the fact of death as, they, uh, as you've gathered to remember this life. So it's anyway, uh, I think that's emotionally rather unhealthy, frankly. And a good death would include, I think, to, to round out this answer, uh, a good ritual uh, to enable others to, um, to release their emotions and to remember the dead and to uh, give the dead to God uh, in, in a ritualized way. But uh, I'd be interested in my colleagues' responses too. Okay, thank you. Thank you much, very much, Brian. Brian, you have brought an interesting issue. So I'd like to start with the issue of Badad, that at the same time, if you just give us an idea about uh, good death and bad death, and at the same time, if you just uh, highlight or briefly talk about that, whether during this, you know, COVID, after COVID situation, the death rituals has any change or not. So uh, please, uh, Sheikh Yusuf Badat. Yeah, sure. So a good death. So definitely if we've prepared for death, both physically as well as spiritually, and we've lived our best life uh, in uh, loyalty to God and his instructions, then definitely that's a great death. Uh, one famous statement comes to mind where the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad, peace and blessings upon him, said, uh, tamutun. The way you live your life, that's the way you're going to die. Tamutun tubathun. And the way you die, the manner you die, that's the manner you will be resurrected. So basically, if we've lived a positive good life to the best of our ability, our death will also be good and our resurrection and return to God will also be great. Uh, the second part of the question uh, is uh, COVID has changed everything. Uh, and that includes uh, some of the rituals that we, we're, we're doing nowadays. And uh, I agree with uh, Reverend as well that uh, families many a times who may not be so acquainted with the requirements of religion, etc., they like to make the occasion many a times just a celebration rather than what uh, the religion instructs us. So from an Islamic perspective, what Islam and the religion instructs us to do is to do two things whenever someone dies. One is to turn to God in prayer because it's a difficult, it's a challenging moment. And the other is reflection. And reflection refers to both the positive of a person's life as well as the lessons that we can learn and reflect upon to learn from the deceased and those who have passed on. Uh, as a, a very famous incident has been recorded on the topic of death, that there was uh, a great king of the past, uh, I believe it was Alexander the Great, uh, when he died, uh, he had uh, instructed his followers that uh, when my procession proceeds, then let it be known that, um, you know, take my hands out up in the air and let it be known that um, I'm not taking anything with me. And regardless of whether I was a king or the ruler of the earth, I still face death. So he was giving a message even though he had passed away and he had died. Yet his, um, his departure was a positive reminder for others. So again, this is the, uh, yes, things are changing. And as we move to the modern world day by day and with all kinds of circumstances upon us, including COVID, uh, there have been uh, requests for altering some of the procedures. But again, from an Islamic point of view, if the minimum requirements are complete, then the funeral is complete, the rites are complete, anything additional uh, may be embraced by some mosques and some institutions in the Muslim communities and others, uh, you know, the clergy or the ministers of religion, the imams, etc., they would be very particular that this is something that is acceptable from the religious point of view and this is something that may not be acceptable. So, uh, you know, there there is a, a lot of positive, but at the same time, 
as as clergy and and religious leaders we do our part to advise even at the challenging times and and moments uh, to at least do what is minimum required for the uh, funeral and the rites the religious rites to be complete uh, for the deceased thank you thank you very much shaky so badatta i think we do not have enough time we'll finish in 8 minutes so uh, last before i move to the last question i would like to ask the same thing to mr shamol that uh, you know we are talking about uh, you know what is your take on this the issue we are discussing uh, well uh, good death is not something that you can buy from the store as a ready made thing <laughs> it is a matter of something that you have to make over the time so that's one the other thing is that nobody knows when death will come it is the only controller of the earth controller is the god he knows when a people will die so if it is true that we nobody knows when our time of death will come if it is true then we have to make ourselves ready for the time for the day and we have to prepare every day with good karma good actions so that at the time of death we can enjoy we can en- smile and other people surrounding us they will cry if it is like that then i can consider is a good death okay. and if there is no sufferings for to our relatives all our friends we can say it is a good death okay thank you Thank, Thank you very much, Mr. Shamal. I think probably we haven't heard from uh, Rabbi Michael on this. Uh, yes, uh, Imam. Well, thank you. Uh, um, I, I want to start with those uh, issues that uh, Reverend uh, Brian raised uh, about uh, the changes that people have, and uh, the, the Jewish response is very similar to the Islamic response that uh, Sheikh Badat mentioned. That there are um, certain basic. Uh, aspects of traditional burial most of which are considered to be an expression of respect for the deceased and respect for the body that the body which carried the soul uh, deserves respect therefore and so uh, our traditions are designed around that value um and uh, there are certain uh, very basic traditions many of which have been difficult to observe during covid because the presence of a community uh of 10 members of the community and more at such times is an essential element of so many of our rituals of burial and mourning and so it's been an extraordinarily difficult and trying time for people i know of all faiths i've just seen the struggles uh had by uh the jewish people that i've served up close during this time uh so it is challenging that way i i admit that um i struggle with the expression uh a good death i know we're describing it in different ways eventually uh i've experienced many many fine upstanding individuals religious or not religious um whose deaths have been tragic sudden or painful um and so uh, like brian mentioned the circumstances of our de- of the death i would imagine when we're saying good death we can't uh be recognizing those but i want to recognize that as a, a powerful and often painful reality um so sometimes people who had a wonderful life in fact um in my experience and from my perspective do not have a good death uh, and nor should we measure anyone's spiritual um preparation or spiritual status by the kind of death that that person experiences okay um, we should absolutely strive to be at peace with the idea of death and to provide peace to those who are in their last moments uh, but sometimes i i think we come very painfully in contact with the limits of our ability to do so whether physically or spiritual thank you very much thank you very much rabai michael dogin we have 5 minutes uh, more to go uh, i had some other issues to discuss but uh, let me just uh, come to the last question say for example we are you know we believe in different faith but we are sharing the same you know screen today here and even my neighbor is from different faith we do the same thing we go you know many things we are doing all together and our roads are same we walk we drive in the same road but after that death, death our roads are different 
you know, you know, according to different faith, people, you know, our bodies are being buried or cremated in a different places. What is the rationale behind it? During life, if we can stay together, after that, why we have to, you know, put ourselves apart? We have to be in different places. So I'd like to start with uh, Brian, my Reverend Brian. Well, uh, so we have a, a phrase that we use in our funeral and memorial rituals uh, often, you know, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Um, we, we come from the earth and to the earth we return, you know. Um, so that's why we're buried. Uh, that's why uh, we bury ashes, because uh, the earth has given us the, the materiality of life and uh, along with the breath of God. And, uh, you know, in the very beginning in Genesis, as my colleagues are well aware, you know, we, we come from the earth uh, and we will return to the earth. Um, but having said that, uh, you know, there's a, a sense in which um, life is uh, meant to be uh, not only enjoyed, but cherished. And, and the cherishing of life in a, in a way that um, enables us to uh, accept death as, uh, as a part of life. You know, uh, the great uh, song about the circles of life, right? The circle of life. Life is a circle and time is a circle. And uh, we, uh, I know that various religions talk about return, death and return in, in uh, another form and so on. We, uh, we usually just talk about a single life, uh, lived well or, or not, but we return to God. But it, it seems that uh, the cherishing of life implies, at least in part, the love of neighbor, uh, the love of uh, the earth, the love of um, friends and family, and of course, the love of God. And uh, if you can live that kind of a cherishing uh, life, a flourishing life, a life lived in the grace and goodness of God, then we'll be able to uh, release ourselves to to death in a way that uh, will honor our, our lives and the lives of others. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rabbi. Uh, Rabbi if you just share this, you know, your perspective from religion, your religion, your faith, during life we do everything together, but after, you know, death, Apparently, we see that different people from different faith, they are going to different places. What is the rationale behind that? Yeah, um, I, I don't know that that really fits. Uh, I think it's an important question. I'm not sure that the question necessarily fits uh, with a, a view of life after death. If life after death, as I understand uh, the Jewish tradition in addressing it, is a life of the soul, it does not need a place. Um, it's not a physical existence. And so it's not as if someone goes here and someone goes there. I've heard, I've heard jokes about such a topic. And I think sometimes when we're too concrete about describing uh, physical um, places, physical imagining of what happens after we die, um, that it sometimes uh, leads to confusion. Um, and I think uh, many of our faiths have in common a sense of din v'cheshbon, of being called to account by the Holy One at the end of one's life for the choices that one made. Um, and I think uh, that that's uh, hopefully something that uh, all of us could prepare for in uh, our traditions. Um, I do think in this world, though, it is important to live together. We don't live together by being the same. Uh, our different religious approaches are not just different versions of exactly the same thing. Um, they represent different lenses, different approaches to life and living and God and community, all of which uh, deserve respect, but also should be recognized as different and distinct. Uh, it is a challenging thing to do, but I believe an important thing to do. Uh, there is a wonderful book for those who are interested in doing that, called How to Be a Perfect Stranger, uh, which is a book that for those living in such a multicultural, multi-faith community like the greater Toronto area um, can give advice on when you attend uh, um, at a moment of loss or any other moment in someone else's tradition, it gives some basic guidance to help one uh, 
know how to fit in and show respect for that other person's religious perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rabbi. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, in fact, I wanted to discuss because the, because of uh, the you know limited time, so we could not cover other things. Uh, I, one of the other thing was you know what happens after life. So anyway, we are not going to touch up on this thing today. So now I would like to ask the same thing to you know briefly, if you just touch up on this thing, the Mr. Shamul, that uh, according to your faith. So you know what do you think? How do you explain that? Uh, in our faith, it says. Uh, there is no restriction. If one person die today, he have to be cremated. That is true. But after the cremation and the ashes or uh, the remains of the uh, cremated crematory remains, you can uh, put in your suitable place. So there is no restriction for that. But as a community member, everybody want to live together. So in a family, we live together in individual faith we live together and this is that concept lives at the end of the life or after the uh, cremation they also find a suitable place where they also can live together so live together in the physical world uh, with different faiths and live together after death the concept is a little bit different so that's why i in my concept in our uh, tradition it says the people with own faith if can be cremated or buried in one place, they feel comfortable. That is the reason. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank, thank you very much. The last but not the least, Imam Sheikh Yusuf Badat. Yeah, uh, from the Islamic point of view, uh, the burial is what is instructed. And as my colleagues have said, uh, we are made from the earth and we are returned to the earth. Now, regardless of which portion of the earth or which uh, grave site or cemetery, uh, our return, our soul goes back to God. The, the physical body, it disintegrates and it becomes part of the earth. Uh, I believe the reason why in diverse communities, because uh, in a Muslim community, in a Muslim country, it's any grave site, it's any cemetery that a person will be buried. But in a diverse community like Toronto or other places, metropolitan uh, cities, when we have designated spots, I believe it's more to do with rituals, the physical rituals. Just like while we are alive, even though we are working together and we're side by side as neighbors, but when it comes to our worship, some of us go to churches, some of us go, go to synagogues, some of us go to temples, some of us go to mosques. Yes, we may visit one another and once in a while attend each other's services. But at the end of the day, we have an affiliation. We have uh, some kind of link with a particular set of traditions and religious uh, requirements. And that is what uh, enables certain communities to put... Uh, certain areas in cemeteries where this is a Christian, where, where Christians are buried, or this is where, um, uh, you know, the Jewish community is buried or the Muslim community. But from an Islamic perspective, we can be buried anywhere. In fact, as one of my colleagues said, that uh, sometimes a person dies and passes away and they are not uh, afforded or, or um, given a burial because simply either their body is not found or they drown somewhere where they cannot be located, but the soul returns back to God regardless. So uh, again, I think it's, it's, it's a sense of an affiliation uh, with a certain tradition that uh, gives us the ability to put our dead in specific areas. But this is not something to show disrespect to another community or another society or another religion. It's just, just like we worship in this life at a church, synagogue, or mosque, uh, or a temple, uh, when we depart, uh, as, as one of my colleagues said, it's, it's a comfort level of where we are going to be buried as we leave this, uh, this temporary abode. Thank you very much. Viewers, you are watching Chit Chat and uh, we, were, we are discussing about death. Though we are discussing about death and the death uh, dying process, but we would like to learn uh, from death about life. Things we have heard from our um, um, faith leaders and I would like to thank you every one of you thank you very much for your time and insights that you shared with us and hopefully we'll next time we'll discuss about some other issues together thank you very much thank, thank you very much. much you're welcome thank you so,